Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, Life Without School. Today I'm going to be sharing four things I wish I'd known earlier in our unschooling journey. Some of these are a little bit vulnerable, especially the fourth one. Um, some of these I've really had to kind of come through and deal with a little bit of sense of failure um, with them. So go easy on me in the comments. <laughs> but I share them in the hope that you'll understand how much of a work in progress creating an unschooling home is. And I share them because actually it might possibly help you avoid them. And just on that note about uh, having a sense of failure, I think that that can be really quite common um, in this era of um, knowing so much <laughs> about healing and brains. Um, it's incredible, it's an incredible gift to understand so much about development and about healthy relationships and healthy family life. It's such a gift, but it is also somewhat of a burden because it means that each year that passes by, you get more information, which then makes you look back at the other bit years and be like, oh, I wish I had known that. And um, I just want to invite into this room, into our room here, that if you do kind of struggle with those feelings, it's totally normal. But I really want to invite you to not let it undermine your life and part of the art of learning new things and opening up to like new information and new ways of doing things and um, as you take on those insights and those kind of breakthroughs to do so with this kind of wing or this important element of self-grace and self-kindness. So take on all the new info and the clarity and the wisdom, but do so with a really big dose here, that's what I'm holding, <laughs> here, of grace and kindness and self-empathy. Talking to yourself, not in terms of, oh, what a failure, or what a hypocrite, but in terms of, oh, I was, I've always been trying my best, I'm always doing my best, I am open and curious, I'm a work in progress. Does that make sense? Just as we talk about ourselves, as we, um, yeah, to just sort of get into a habit of being very nurturing with our words and how we speak about ourselves and our changing lives. With no further ado, adieu, adieu. Uh, I'm going to crack on with number one. It has been a long realization for Tim and I to understand quite how much social time our daughter needs. You know, I knew early on that she loved hanging out and playing with kids, and we used to organize a lot of fun and a lot of play. I also had a real fundamental belief that she needed to be okay by herself and with just her sibling. And I think for a long time I let that belief um, override really honouring her needs for big group fun. I guess I used to think that um, long days spent just with the family were really healthy and um, didn't quite prioritise her social needs in the same way that we do now. And now I understand that social activity and being with people and relating to people is part of my daughter's superpower. It's also a real driver for her. So um, most things are not really that fun for her unless there's a good pal involved. So most wholesome activities I mean, literally name them. Uh, building clay, gardening, hiking, mushroom foraging, watercolours, guitar playing. Most of those activities would be like a straight up nope from my daughter. Unless you throw in a friend or several, in which case it's an immediate yes and she is totally into it. And I, I, I honestly have to confess that even as I'm saying this year, I'm like, ah, oh, it was so obvious early on. I really did let a kind of internal belief about kind of resilient and being alone, being like important, that I actually 
only in the last probably two or three years have we really super committed to getting her as much fun time as possible um, and only just have managed to strike that balance right. And the really important thing here is this, you might need more friends in your life, but wait, that sentence isn't over. You might also need less friend time for your kids in your life. The thing here is that only your children can let you know that. They are the only feedback here that you should go on. This is really about laying down those kind of threads of beliefs that come up for you about resilience or what childhood should look like or what your kids should need. It's about laying all of that down and tuning in and going, where does my kid come alive? Is it in big groups of people? Is it in one-to-one -one relationships? Is it alone? and being completely honest and responsive to that feedback from your child. So that's number one, hopefully that's a bit helpful, bit confessional. Okay, number two is a good one. And this I did realize quite early on actually. This one is about my personal fulfillment being really quite important to the overall ecology of our unschooling home. It can be way too common for the parents, particularly the stay-at-home parents who are with the kids all of the time, to put their own needs and desires and dreams way on the back burner. And I guess I just want to invite you into this understanding that your self-actualization, your fulfillment and sense of meaning is really, really crucial to the thrivability and the overall happiness of everyone's life. But for some of you, you're gonna get that all of that from the homeschooling, from the home ed, from the being with your kids and playing and creating and, and adventuring. And you're gonna to be totally fulfilled and I'm really happy for you. Others of you wah, wah, uh, need more. You need to create, you need to paint, you need to have big visions that you bring to life, you need to host events and plan big adventures, you need to sing and date and dance and make music and DJ, <laughs> you need to do all of those things. If you're that kind of person and you can build those into your life, that is going to have a direct effect on the overall thing. Because if you're feeling fulfilled and you've got a full cup, um, it's, it will spill over, your kids will have an amazing role model of someone following their bliss. My first intro to this really came when probably Ramona was five and Juno was three and I read a book called The Endorphin Effect and it is all about how our bodies are given happy chemicals and if you can tap into them, everything flows, you get put into a real resource state. And so if you can activate those chemicals, then every day is just like joy to joy, good times. <laughs> so that was my open door and, and at that point I began skating, dancing, just really having a fun adult life myself for Lucy. Okay, number three, also confessional. I think on some level I had a belief that the unschooling life I was to lead was to be in the wild, surrounded by unschoolers. That is where I thought the best unschooling went down. And, you know, so we super concentrated on that. We went off grid totally, moved into yurts, did the whole shebang, and absolutely no regrets whatsoever. But I do also hear this echoed around the place that, you know, unschooling requires plenty of access to wide open natural spaces, absolutely loads of unschoolers, a sort of like utopian unschooling environment. And I do not believe that anymore. At all, not even close. I honestly think that, like right now, we have been living for two and a half months now in a little town we are literally have neighbours right there, like a few metres away, and we have neighbours right there. I can see those neighbours through the window. Um, we have a section, and we're like a few minutes walk away from town. And we're having a great unschooling life. 
Um, we have school kids everywhere. It's a very school fixated culture, as small towns can be. You know how they totally evolve around the school. Um, so it's it's very much the opposite to the wild, unschooling, isolated life we have been living. Um, but it's really, really cool. Um, it means there's loads of things the kids can do. They do circus, an art class, they can bike to the skate park by themselves, they walk the dog everywhere by themselves, they go to the shop by themselves. And so it's been a really cool glimpse of how unschooling can look in a town setting. And in the same way, I feel like living in a big ass city also can offer up a massive gem-filled unschooling experience, like all that access to museums and art galleries and city parks and city farms and diversity of people and gigs, oh my god, gigs! <laughs> you know, all that amazing stuff that you really can only find in big cities is just like a total treasure trove for unschooling families. So I guess I really just want to invite you into that, like push away that old myth that unschooling needs to happen in a certain place and just say nope, it can truly happen anywhere. Okay, my last one, something I wish I had known sooner, is that I wish I was more willing to entertain the idea of neurodiversity I was unwilling for many, many years. I didn't really look into it. I was very influenced by a particularly New Zealand culture within the home ed community of not labelling your children. This idea that you don't label kids, they are how they are and you just respond to them as they need to be responded to. And kind of love that idea rolled with it for a long time and only when my eldest was eight did I learn a little bit more and go, oh my goodness, we're all ADHD. <laughs> Not quite all, but most of my family <laughs> are. And I can laugh about it now, but um, it was a huge revelation, huge. And I actually, really went through um, a big period of feeling ashamed that I was so unwilling to um, have my daughter diagnosed. Angry a little bit actually at the belief that we should not label kids. Um, and even now I feel really sad about that belief because it's nice if you can live in an environment that is wholly embracing of neuro diversity. Yay, you know, in utopia, let's definitely not label people, you know, but we don't. We live in a neurotypical world and there is absolutely masses about this society that we live in which is really quite oppressive of people um, with neurodivergent minds. And until we live in that utopia, your child being able to access more information about how their brain works and other people whose brain works that way is a really, really, really good idea. So since diagnosis, we have had tons of conversations about um, brains with superpowers and why things are particularly hard and we do not pathologize it at all. There is no sense of this brain being a second grade brain, but we're just way more open, way more resourced. Oh my God. I honestly think back to so many years of my parenting life where I just felt like completely exhausted, so many questions, feeling like I was doing it all completely wrong, wondering why, feeling like the worst parent ever. And um, now I understand that that is a state really quite particular to a parent of a neurodivergent child who doesn't know about it and just doesn't have the understanding, the support that they need and the tools that they need. Oh, that one feels really heavy actually. And the biggest thing I have to say about that is if as a parent you've ever had the thought Oh, I think there might be something 
bit different about my kid. That's a really important thought. It's a really good guiding hunch. And um, if you have had that thought, I just recommend that you take a little bit of time researching all the different brain wirings out there and seeing if any one of them in particular rings true for your child. You don't have to have a formal diagnosis. You don't have to do that. You can just let this information into your life and let it inform your toolbox and let it inform how you access support and how you can come back, you know, to the speaking to yourself, how you begin, how you start talking to yourself. I would say of all of these, that one is the most significant. That is one I just really wish. I knew earlier, but I let existing kind of conditioned beliefs really influence how I was parenting and how I was living my life. And um, yeah, I guess if there's an overall message from this whole video, it would be to just stay really open-minded. Don't take wholesale an infrastructure of beliefs from unschooling and download them. or whatever pedagogy you're into and download them. Always just stay responsive and be guided by your inner wisdom and your family wisdom. Be guided by your children's needs, this beautiful responsive dance that you're doing. Let that be the main thing and this infrastructure of beliefs be essentially a bit movable. Listen in. Yeah, so there's my confessions. I would love to hear from you. Is there anything you wish you had known earlier about unschooling? Please go nuts, share in the comments. Love to hear from you as always. If you haven't hit subscribe and the bell, do that because then, fingers crossed, you might hear from me the next time I do a video. <laughs> Stay radical.